Welcome back to another episode of the BVA Boardroom Podcast. We have an awesome guest today. I'm doing a little intro here on you, a little bio. Like so Matt Bauscher, owner of Bauscher Real Estate, uh, co-owner of Amherst Madison, uh, the number one selling realtor in the state of Idaho. Uh, Matt uh, received his bachelor's from Boise State University, his master's from Concordia University, born and raised in the Treasure Valley, uh, former Boise State Bronco basketball player, professional basketball player, uh, Netherlands, Germany, and Cyprus, and uh, probably the number one BSU fan. We want to talk a little bit about that, even though we won't agree on it. <laughs> I'll take it. We're excited to have you here, buddy. This Thank is awesome. So, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we. Uh, we're booting this back off, and, and I told these guys, they're like, who do you want to get on? I'm like, I want to get the young guns on. I think there's you and Brian will be on here. Yep. There's, a, there's, another, there's another generation of leaders here in the Valley that whether it's a nonprofit, um, community-led initiatives, education, you guys seem to be the guys that are, are kind of taking, we're passing the baton to you. Yeah. So uh, We need to step up. You guys have been doing it for so many years. Getting it's, old, Matt. That's a good way of saying yeah. I'm getting old. But thank you for all you do in the community. I want to start with that. Um, you are become like uh, the go-to, and it's a pleasure having you on here today. It's easy when you live in a community like this, right, to go all in. I mean, it, are we blessed or what? It is easy. I want to start off with business. A lot of people that listen to this are... Business folks, uh, I'll probably just give a little synopsis of kind of what we're feeling. So for years, literally every year, we would have our weekly meeting. We'd say, okay, when are interest rates going up? And we were, we were planning our debt and our cash, cash position to be ready for it. And it never happened for like years and years yep. and years. And then COVID hit. It just kind of this hyper low in, uh, uh, interest rate environment we were in. Um, we knew would end at some point, but it just lasted forever. And then it happened. Yep. And then all of a sudden we have the, the largest increase in history. And then I think for most people, we were like, okay, what does this mean? Because when you get older, you've been through enough of these. Yep. You're like, okay, is it going to be, you know, they've talked about a soft landing. They talked and, and, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to disrupt what was going on. I think here we are, um, you know, January, 2024, I cannot wait to hear from you two things. One, kind of looking back, what happened to our market and what did you kind of see and feel? And then probably more importantly, now that, you, now that the Fed yep. met um, a couple weeks ago, what do you think we're looking at in 2024? But so first start about what your your take was on, uh, it's going to be a long answer, but but just kind of rates, housing in Boise, future and and take it wherever you want to take it. I think we we were growing at a good rate. I've been in this 10 years now, and every year from 13 to 14 to 15 to 16, there was appreciation, but it wasn't great appreciation. I bought a house in 2010 when I was playing ball in Europe for 275 from DL Evans, the bank. And in 2015, five years later, it only got 350. So it was like a three to 5% increase every year. And people thought in 2019, the market was gonna you know start to go down. It had gone up for seven years in a row. So COVID hits, and me and my business partner are like, well, are we going to have to put showers in the commercial office and bring the family and live there? Because it might get really dicey. And what happened was, an, it'll never happen again, an unprecedented rush to Idaho because of lifestyle restrictions, shutdowns, mandates, kids you know, in school. It was an emotional move to Boise. And you know how it is trying to get a subdivision approved here. It's years. You can't just turn on a faucet and say there's 2,500 homes, right? It's such a long process from farmland to home, and we didn't have we didn't have the we we didn't have the inventory. So what it did was is when you're when you're in residential real estate, you know, commercial real estate, you guys actually use pen to paper and have to have some numbers make sense. Sometimes if it's your family, I don't care if I'm overpaying by fifty or hundred thousand dollars. It's my family, it's my sanctuary, and I saw it. I mean, I was on the in the trenches. I mean, my phone. If you had a TV around, I should have had seven cell phones. I mean, every second of every day, my phone was blowing up from the entire country, and it was wild. Interest rates were basically free. People wanted to move here, and the monthly payment is what mattered, which was not healthy for as far as the locals. I feel bad for you know the locals who can't buy a house right now. But 
what I thought most people thought would have happened is there'd be a lot of short sales and foreclosures, but everybody with a low interest rate said, I'm going to hunker down, stay here. So, so let's talk about that. So yep. you have this, <clears throat> because I think you just encapsulated exactly kind of how we got caught. Yep. Everyone's coming here. Rates are super low. Um, you know, I think there was inventory, but it got eaten up very quickly. So then talk about the appreciation that happened to those same houses. What, what did you see in the market? Uh, a house that was worth 500 went to... A house that was worth 500 went to 750 in 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 50% increase in 18 months, which is so unhealthy. Yeah, so so that happens, and then you were getting back to, okay, what, what's going to happen? Then rates start going up. I think most people that I was talking to are like, okay, if we get two, three, four-point increases, we're going to start seeing foreclosures. Nope. We're going to start people. And what's happened is there's so many people locked into low rates. Yep. And now we're kind of, I think we're capped out. Yep. Did we avoid it? So, so, so the first question for you is, we did avoid it. Do you think we've avoided a, a major, major crash? I think we did. What a lot of builders who went through it in, in 2008, 2009, 2010, they sold everything quickly. And they said, I'm going to reset my basis on everything. I'm getting rid of this bad inventory. And they were way ahead of the curve. When July 12th hit, uh, June to July 12th of 2022, and I kind of saw it coming about a month earlier, sold all my flips and investments. And, you know, it's like Wall Street. You go to jail for insider trading real estate. I know it, you know, kind yeah. of, and it's yeah. legal. So uh, let's make sure everyone, it's completely legal, right? I know it's going to, I mean, you know, so I, I'm, you I'm know always coming. Coming two months ahead, right? The yeah. calls, the yeah. how many showings am I getting? What's the offers coming in? Like it's, you're always about a month to two months ahead. And I think it showed the real estate market was pretty resilient. It really was because we didn't have very much inventory. This year, the Valley will sell 12,000 homes for $7 billion, which, you know, it's, it's down, but it's still a lot of volume happening. So this is the question. There's a few questions I cannot wait to hear what you have to say because we haven't talked about this. So so the Fed meets. They, they signal, hey, we're, we're, we're done. Maybe three cuts next year. Cuts. They're backing off that a little bit now, but maybe three cuts. We still have an inventory problem. Yep. We really never had much compression in, in values. Some, you can tell me yeah. more, maybe in different segments of yeah. the market. What does the future of housing look like for us? Because you got Micron doing what they're doing. $15 yep. billion dollar fab. 250 companies coming to the Valley just to support the fab. You've got, you still have the crazy politics of, of liberal oh, yeah. coastal cities going on. That's even worse. I, I've had, I, we've had a lot of people in from San Francisco over the last couple of weeks. I, I thought it was bad and then I hear horror stories of what's going on. So the, the, so the environment around us staying the same, we still have no inventory, we've got Micron coming, we've got this great business, I mean, we're a victim of our own success, yeah. right? Uh, when we're with, we were with Gover Governor Little the other yep. night, right? That was a good so, night. So super low regulations. Yep. We're still like this heritage of what what Idaho and America yep. is, and people are flocking here. So what happens with housing? The stories I hear too from some of the coastal cities, from the families that are moving here. I mean, I should write a book. It is we we're so sheltered here. We have no idea how good we have it until you hear some of these stories. That's real life. Um, but we were underappreciated that no one talks about. I was playing ball, and I got uh, I think it was my second year overseas. I got a house on Leadville for fifty two thousand dollars. That is so undervalued. So when it went up, it was so we were so undervalued that you know it was a dramatic increase. So your point is part of the dramatic increase was just kind of truing up where we probably should have been. Hundred percent. Okay. Um, but I think with three rating, with three rate decreases in twenty twenty four election year, people are on edge. But I don't see prices going down at all in the residential world. And there will go be up. I don't see them going up more than 5%. There won't be a lot of spec builders who will take that risk. Certain price points, they will. All the nationals, you know, the under 700,000, those guys will will still throw out product, product. But I don't see as many spec homes inventory out there, which I think a lot of people are pent up demand too. They're ready to move. They're just waiting for that opportunity to get a bigger house, smaller house, downsize. I call it all the Ds. The people who are making decisions now, this year, was death, divorce, di diapers, diplomas, um, you name it. It's it was all the people who had to make a decision. What maybe you don't want to share the secret sauce for, but for people out there listening right now, what what are the indicators you follow? Like because I know you're a you're a data guy and, and I know you look at things, but are, are there indicators? Is it is it listings on the market? Is it average home prices? Is it move ins? What are the, what's the, what are the data that are really important to you? doing what you do, being the number one guy in the state. I really like to follow inventory. If there's a, let's just say it's, a, which is pretty close, about a thousand homes sell in the Treasure Valley every month. 
And if there's about a thousand listings, you know, active, we know we only have a month of inventory. Now, if there was 7,000 listings and we're only selling a thousand a month, we're in trouble because there's seven months it's going to take to absorb that inventory. So I really like to see, and then you can get really into it, you know, a certain subdivision, the subdivision I live in, there's no home for sale, right? Or another subdivision, there's 11 for sale. So it's almost like I tell sellers, hey, who are you competing with in your subdivision? Because if you wait for a certain month and there's four, everybody's going to say, what's wrong with this subdivision? There's four for sale on the same street. So it's a timing game, but it's an inventory game, and then kind of seeing what the market can bear for certain products. I mean, the luxury market's on fire right now. Hmm. Um, I know, I know you're a single family guy and, and really that's where you've, that's where your expertise is. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about multifamily? Um, so I think a lot of multifamily developer friends, um, they were underwriting these projects at a, probably a, a crazy low, right? I mean, yep. they were under light at like a three and a half cap. And as soon as interest rates went up, their model was on its head, right? So I think a lot of people that have uh, been concerned about multifamily, they're saying, oh, it's, you know, it's dead, whatever, it's, it's a problem. But, but the reality is there still needs to be more inventory in our, in our town with everything that's going on. Um, what do you think the short and medium and long term is for multifamily here in the Valley? It's hard to pencil it right now, building ground up with the interest rates and getting a cap rate that's reasonable. But also the guys who are locked in with low cap rates, they're, they don't want to sell because where are they going to deploy their money? Right. So they're, you know, they're sitting there at a nice seven, seven, eight percent cap with appreciation on top of it. And they're saying, I don't want right. to try to go find something else. Um, but what happened was, as you know, from 2010 to 2014, nobody's building multifamily. Yeah. So we were behind and 25,000 people moving in the valley every year. And we're behind and behind and behind. And now the college age and it's where, you know, they don't have anywhere to live. Are they going to live with mom till they're 25? I mean, that's the, that's the dilemma. And some people don't want to live in apartments, you know, at certain ages of their life, but they're forced to. And that's the complexity of that. You know, they have the pinwheel and the, everybody has the ground level and different styles. But um, it's an intriguing market that I really want to dive into and really, you know, be an owner of one day is, is multiple doors like that because it's nice mailbox money that I think a lot of people like. Sure. And uh, do you get a feel for, I don't know whether this is a good question or not, but in, in, your, in your world, which, which you, you really see that need because you're talking to people coming here and, and you're in the market every day, do you get an idea of just how short we are on inventory? Is it, is it how many, I mean, is it thousands or, or where are we are with an inventory, with a need, especially in a decrease? On a single family or a single family? I think, I mean... And it just takes so long to get things approved here. I'm involved in four or five subdivisions right now, and we're going on year three, yeah. and there's not lots for sale yet. So I think, you know, if we could, and the nationals that want to buy finished lots, but we just got to, we got to get more um, affordable, I think, to under 500 price point, which is really hard to do with land prices and building costs right now. But the under 500 is a is definitely a big need, not only for investors, but obviously first time home buyers, downsizers, because the big problem is, is we don't have the income and the jobs yet. A lot of people moving here, yeah, they have cash, but they're not working. So they're helping the service industry and the top golfs and that and the restaurants, but they're not necessarily, you know, bringing an income here. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, I, I think back, so I was on the United Way board for several years and there was this, uh, it, it was uh, Alice, Asset Limited Income Constrained but Employed was the moniker for it, but was, it was basically the working poor. And if you go back, I, I pulled up that data recently and I looked at what average income was then and what it is now. We have certainly seen an increase that, oh, yeah. that you know, if, if you would have just said in one of those United Way meetings, hey, income's going to go from this to that. And it's going to be great for all these families in the Treasure Valley. Everyone would have freaking out saying, oh, that's going to be awesome. But the problem is, to your point, yeah, we've seen some wage increase, but it has not kept pace on the housing side with what's no. happened with maybe undervalued, right? So yeah. probably undervalued and then got valued and then you know, a premium on that. But I, you know, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. I've got a, I got a few people that are really close to our family and I see how, you know, one is a single mother um, and... I watch her and we try to help her all we can, but I watch her navigate housing and uh, I have for 20 years and it, it is, it's interesting. It's tough for people out there still. So I think your point, I, I really glad you hit there was like, w w when do we see like that sub 500 market and where's it going to be at yeah. current land prices and cost of construction and what happened with just infrastructure. Just if you just took what it took per linear foot of sewer or water or, or what joint trench was, yeah. 
then versus now, oh. it's going to be tough to, to, to deliver that. Uh, but ultimately, housing is the problem, right? It really is. And I think the infrastructure will help that, that you can move further out like you see in some of the big metropolitan cities and not feel like it's forever away. I know Highway 16 is going to be a huge addition. Yep. But, you know, the, the traffic going west, it's a problem. Yeah. You know, we have a we have a little committee we have going. It's Idaho 2040, and I've got – I need you to be on it, actually. I'll ask you today to be on it with us. But we're, we're, we're growing, but we're, we're looking at how can the business community help with infrastructure because if you look at our right-of-way on I-84, right? Yep. I mean, if you sit down with ITD, and there's some really good people at ITD. Yeah. I'm not – this is not – and you say, hey, what's the next step, right? They'll say, well, we've got enough right-of-way on I-84 for one more lane. Okay, what does that get us? And that probably gets us, in their estimation, seven to eight years. And yeah. then you say, okay, what's the plan after that? And they literally, really good people will say, there is no, there's no more right-of-way. There's no, and so I think, I think we're going to need business leaders and folks that are in it for the long haul to kind of help navigate policy, yeah. uh, to try to help uh, that problem. Because I think if not, you know, the roadways are going to speak for themselves. You're going to have gridlock. Oh, yeah. And then you're going to have residents saying, hey, we got to do something. But anyway, uh, that, that'll be the next problem. Hey, I, a couple of questions before we talk about a few other things I want to talk about. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about you uh, growing up here, um, what it was like growing up here. And I met your, met your, met your dad a few times. Yep. What was it like being a, being a Boise kid and staying here and going to school here? We, I actually was born in Twin Falls. My dad gets a job with Design West Architects, so we leave Twin Falls. He was the superintendent at Kimberly, a small school outside of Twin Falls. He gets a job, so all my family lives kind of in the Homedale area, my mom's side. So we moved to Caldwell, and I go to Valley View, and uh, there was not as much going on in 1990 as there is now. I mean, it was a one-lane one lane freeway. Downtown didn't really have a presence, and I loved it. I loved living here. I loved like my childhood friends, the sports, the, you know, it was a great, great childhood that I wouldn't trade it for the world. And when I, my whole life growing up, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just want to play for Boise State and people. So you, did you grow up a, a one sport athlete? Tennis. So I was a state champion tennis player too. Okay. Yep. So I got basketball and tennis. I did all the sports as a kid. And then, you know, in high school, you got to kind of, take them. yeah. And so then tell us about playing for Boise State. It was surreal. I mean, I, I wanted to play there so bad, and I get, you know, player of the year, my senior year, and no scholarships. I mean, nothing. And then you and Albertsons, it was Albertsons at the time. College of Idaho and you wouldn't even give me full rides. So I went to a junior college one year, and then Boise State said, hey, if you want to walk on, we'll give you a scholarship two years. You have four years to play three. Walk on, and we'll give you a guaranteed two years with a chance to get the third year. And uh, my parents go, take the scholarship at Montana, you know, or University of Idaho offered, take a scholarship at Idaho. And I knew I wanted to raise my family in Boise. And they, the local athletes who go away, they're forgotten. They really are. I mean, you're a great athlete at nothing against University of Utah or, you know, Michigan or some of these schools, but you just get lost, you know. Yeah. So I was like, I know I want to raise a family in Boise. I'm going to try to meet as many people as I can during those four years. Had a couple of really good mentors back then, and I was already thinking down the road in college. I was already thinking life after basketball, and it was the greatest decision ever. I ended up starting every game my sophomore year, and we won the championship my senior year, and I was team captain. And I was using more will call tickets than anyone in history. Everybody got four tickets, so we had 52 tickets for the team, and I think I averaged 48 free tickets every game. Oh, my word. That's, that's great. And I know your folks loved it. Oh, yeah. They went to every game, every grandparents, game. cousins, you name it. That's fantastic. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, life after, after basketball and how you, and I asked Brian this too, but um, one of the things that I've found with business leaders is, is they usually have some life experience and drive and motivation. Whatever they were passionate about, they learn a lot of life lessons, and then they translate that to their business life. Yep. From the outside looking in at you, Matt, and I think I know you pretty well, you're a relationship guy. You work harder than anyone else I've ever been around. But tell me what, what else you learned from kind of sports, drive, motivation that helps you in your day-to-day -day business life. Because I think a lot of people out there would appreciate that. Something that I, am, I try to, you know, 
emulate what you've done is energy is everything. So when I was playing basketball and the coach or somebody would be down and on you, you're shooting, praying it goes in, you're not loose, you're playing tense. You see a quarterback throw interceptions, he's, it's in his head, it's cerebral, same with basketball. So what I said was when I build a team, I want them to be loose, excited, energetic, ready to run through walls because they'll perform at their best. If they come in and like, what kind of mood is Matt in? Or he's like, why'd you do that? You know, you're playing to not make a mistake. So just like business. So I'm like, I'm going to grow a team that's going to be fun. They're going to want to run through walls for me. They're going to answer the phone early and late when I'm not around because they care. And I, I, I emulated the team I'd want on the sports team because I knew the championship year that we had. And then we, I won a couple of championships in Europe. The chemistry, you couldn't even explain the locker room and the chemistry. Like, we'd be down five or four minutes left, and everybody knew we were going to win the game. And that's just something you can't, you know, the average fan just doesn't know that when it comes down, you all believe in each other. You got that swag, and you're like, it's going to happen. I think that's so awesome because a lot of times people will say it's all about the people around you, which is true. It is. But it's also about the environment and culture that is created from the leadership yep. and from those individuals, right, where you feed off yep. each other. And I don't think that, I think that's the harder part, right? Because yeah. culture is contagious, but it also takes a lot of work. So yeah. what are some of the things you do to create and to maintain? I think creating a culture yeah. is easy. I think, uh, we'll talk about Boise State in a minute, but yeah. I think it's really easy to be the rah-rah guy and to yeah. be the, hey, yo, yep. let's go do this thing for a short time. I think over time, you better have some yeah. practices and principles and culture in place that yep. is sustainable. So in the business world, what's your sustainable culture? I think if, if the leader wants power or it's all about him, they'll see right through it. Yeah. If you generally care about their interests, their family, and you generally would do anything for their family, it's different because not only are they buying in, their family's buying in. And it's way bigger than business. Yeah. So that to me, I think is irreplaceable. But, and then a lot of times you get employees that have bad habits and you got to, you know, change them. I'll give you an example. I have a lady working for me who's, you know, never had confidence. She's always a worker, 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 but no confidence. So she keeps asking me for these little questions, little questions, little questions. We only got a certain amount of days and, you know, to answer all these little questions, you can't grow. So finally I said, answer what you think I would say. And if you make a mistake, we'll deal with it. I trust you. And the amount of questions I get from her now is, is 10 times less. I'm empowering her and it's, it's the culture effect. And she's helping somebody and it's all, you know, in a, in, a, in a world where it's me, 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 it's pretty powerful if you can make it about, you know, the team. I love what you said. You can't fake authenticity. You can't. No. Like, do, you, do you care about people? Do you care about their families? Do you care about them? And if they feel that it's real and, and if, you, if you're faking it, you're not long for no. being a leader, right? No. I love that. I love that. Let's talk Boise State. Yep. Huge fan, right? Oh, yeah. You, you probably are. If the, you cut me right now, blue's going to come out. <laughs> I know. It's been rough this last it year. It has. The football thing, right? And I'm so emotional, too. Like, oh. I'm, I'm a, you know, I wear, my, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. You always know how I am. I will tell you, I haven't even really talked about it because I'm the same way. And I, and I, like, you know Corey Hall, right? Oh, I love so Corey. Corey, guy's my best friend. We yep. talk all the time. Really, really good friends with Andy. Yep. Um, so I think my perspective is probably different and I haven't wanted to be negative. So I've yeah. just kind of like, haven't said anything, yeah. but, but, um, really interesting year, uh, for sure. Um, won, a, won those games that they, in my opinion, should have won anyway, yeah. lost the bowl game. Now going into this next year, how, how are you, how are you feeling about all this? You know, the quarterback position is going to be huge. And I, I, you know, the locker room, you saw it at the end and you know, a lot of it, it could be misconstrued a million different ways. I love Andy. I think Andy is an incredible family man. He's an incredible person. He's going to have the defense at TCU rolling. I can guarantee it. And whether he's better fit as a defense coordinator, head coach, I think the next 20 years will probably dictate that. And um, But Spencer, what he's doing, it's – I mean, you can't help but love the guy. I mean, he's – the players, what they what they say about him. I mean, I'm not in the locker room. I'm not. It's the players that you know see him every day during ups and downs. But you know, also it's it's good when you have a momentum. It'll be good to see you know when you lose a couple games how that sticks together because everybody can be in a good mood when you're winning and you have momentum. It's when you get kicked in the mouth a couple times, you lose two games in a row, and you really got to dig down deep that you know you see you see how you have guys. But um, I'm glad Bush Hamden's staying. I'm a huge Bush fan. I mean, their offense wasn't dynamite this year, and they scored over 30 almost every single game with multiple quarterbacks and a lot of weaknesses. Um, but to keep to keep Genty, 
yeah. mean, that is the home run of the NIL in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Shocking to me. Shocking. Shocking to me. Dude. Yeah. I won't. I think it, it's going to open Pandora's box a little bit, right? Yep. Because um, I think you talk to people in other programs around the country, how they're handling it, and it just does, right? Yep. How, how do you pay one guy and not pay another guy? Yep. How do you pay one guy this and not another guy that? Yep. It's going to be tough. The other, the other question I have about the NIL thing is is I get it, right? College football makes billions of dollars. Yep. Name, image, image, and likeness should go to the player, but it seems like the person getting off on this is everyone making all the money. Yeah, and then it comes back down to the local programs and schools, and they're going out to the business community saying, "Hey, I need you to pay my guy four hundred thousand yeah. bucks." I'm like, "Well, isn't that supposed to be part of the the billions of dollars that you're making? No Somehow kidding. getting it back to the players? It makes no sense to me. Because, Zero. Because you you already go from a donor base that, frankly, in in our market is not huge. No. Um, you look at our endowment fund as a school. You look at you look at what the legislature gives Boise State yeah, every year. Very we're, we're last. We're last in the Mountain West in what we get funded. So last in the Mountain West, endowment fund, fundraising. You know, I think there's a lot of things that they could do that's better there, but they don't. And then along comes NIL, and they're going back to that same donor base and saying, yeah. hey, Genty needed 300, oh, yeah. he needed 300 grand, a house and a car. This guy needs this, this, and this. I don't know how that works, Matt. Yeah, and I, I'm into some of those conversations. What's hard for me is the pencil. Like the guy's making, let's just say a quarterback they got at Miami that's $2 million. Unless you just love, love, love the sport, you're not getting an ROI on that money. No. Unless you have rights to him if he goes to the NFL or something. I don't know if those big contracts, there's, there's trails. But to me, I mean, the three guys who just write the $25 million contract to fire people, it's like it, they got way too much money. They do, and yeah. we don't have it. No. We don't have the oil money. We don't have some of that money where three guys can just, you know, change everything. Because they're passionate and they've got yep. a billion and they're like, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll spend it. Yep. So I, I don't know how that works. And, and that's probably my biggest frustration with how it went down. I think funda the fundamentals of how Andy got in trouble yeah. have not changed one bit. No. And he recruited all those guys. Yep. He recruited that coaching staff. Yep. And so... You know, it, it to me the problems are the same. It's the same fan base. That look at next year's preseason schedule. How many games are they going to lose? Yeah, it's going to be tough. Three out of four. It's going to be really tough. So you add the bowl game in, they're going to be lose four out of five games, and is it the same drum beating on another guy? Yeah. That was beating before with nothing changing in the fundamentals. I yeah. think people are naive. If this was a business, yeah, you would sit down and say we are sick. We've got, you know, I go back to the ER, right? But yeah. let's diagnose the illness. Here's yeah. the, here's like the, here's the differential yeah. diagnosis and here's the illness. Let's go fix the underlying problems. Oh yeah. Instead of giving you something that, that covers up your nausea. Oh yeah. And I think all we are doing is saying, Hey, here's some, here's some Zofran. So you stop puking. Yeah. Because the underlying illness is not treated. And I think he's going to be the next victim of all this. And the money, I mean, the money's one thing, but you can't tell me you're happy paying Caleb Williams and them going seven and six at USC. Oh, no. I mean, you, that's a disappointing year. Wait, wait till the donor gets burned. Oh, yeah. Wait till, wait. Well, the players are getting burned, too. That's what nobody's talking about. We had a guy transfer who's promised all this money, and the day before school, it never came. Right. Wanted to come back. Oh, it's and, a mess. Nope. It's a mess. Yeah, I don't know how you, it's, it's, it, it's going to be bad the next five years. And, but I think the, you know, one, one thing I will say is I think the average Bronco Nation fan, is a little more realistic. You think so? The, now than they were two a year I, ago, two I years do ago. I believe you. Because you look at the eye test. We're not we're not overly talented from anybody. You know, besides you know a few players yeah. like the Genty and that. Yeah. The talent's getting pretty even. Yeah. I don't know, buddy. Well, I, I hope they do well. I really do. Let's talk basketball. Season. Yes. You're a huge Leon Rice guy. So am I. I was supposed to be going to Spokane today, but not going. You're not. I shouldn't say the time, I guess, because you don't know when it's going to air, but. Yeah, they'll edit it. No, well, uh, that. What do you think? What do you think is going to happen this year in the season? I'm very well. It's the Mountain West. They're 20 and five against the Pac-12. Loaded the Big again. East, the WCC. They're great. I mean, we get the next home game. Well, Utah Valley. We get number 16 in the country, Colorado State here. Yeah. And then you got San Diego State and Nevada's rolling. I mean, it's it's, it's going to be a bloodbath for some teams in there, and I love it. I think we're built for it. We got the maturity. We got the guys who've kind of been there and done that, and we're tough I, inside. I love the new roster, don't you? Yeah, I do. It's, I really do. It's awesome. Um, do we need to talk a little bit about you getting thrown out of any games this year? I think after two years, there's statute of limitations. I think we're at the two-year mark. <laughs> so I think, I mean, 
after two years, I think it's hey, good. Can I go on the record? They deserved it. Oh, man. they were so bad. They were so bad. So bad. And I'm really proud of you because you've kind of quieted down. But in, in another way, I'm kind of disappointed because you're just saying all the things we're, we want to say. I was thinking, you know, one time it's okay. If it happens twice, I mean, people are going to think I got a serious problem, right? <laughs> You're just saying what everyone's thinking. Hey, let's talk about the community. Yeah. You do a lot for the community. Uh, you just had a big event you, you hosted. Yep. Um, talk about that and talk about what you see as community needs and how, how business leaders can help. I've been on the board for Make-A-Wish Idaho for, I think, six years now. That's always been a huge part. And um, the Idaho Film Society just started. So we're trying to bring a vibrant film you know, presence in downtown Boise. You know, Maybe it's commercials. Maybe it's movies. You know, Some kind of just vibrant scene and they started that six six months ago they already have a ten thousand square foot building they got some local celebrity actors who live here who are going to be donating on the board and doing that and i think it's just a fun project uh, so that's one thing i think is really neat and i really want to get more involved with boise rescue mission and women's and children's alliance are kind of the other two that have my heart um hearing some of those stories in our own streets and you know 300 people checking in and it's winter and kids and women and oh it just kills me inside to know that's going on yeah uh, there's some shocking statistics, as you know, we've done a lot with homelessness and, and tried to help um, in, in several areas. But for as good as we have it, um, there's a lot of need. Um, there are also a lot of wonderful organizations that really have their finger on the pulse of yeah. where the needs are. And so one of the plugs I would put in today, you mentioned some of them, WCA, yep. Boise Rescue Mission. Um, you could go down the list of kind of the top safety net organizations, but they really do a great job with money and it all stays local. Yeah. Um, I love what Seven Cares does every year because they, they take those same 10 safety net organizations and all those dollars stay here in Idaho and help out. But we also have a very giving community. I, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the way we step up collectively anytime yeah. there's a need. It seems like it's the same people that are getting called saying, hey, yeah. here's what we need to do. But thank you for always being, you always answer that call when it, ha when it happens. And I'm really pumped with the program you guys are installing, you know, to get get the trades going yeah. right the golf tournament yeah. we did and then yeah little was talking about is it launcher teens to, yeah so teens to trade um, teens to we're, trades. We're, we're going to get at risk kids and getting scholarships to cwi in in welding plumbing electrical and hvac and then i think governor little's leadership on this launching that was not easy for no. to get that through but 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 providing dollars for our kids to get them into the trades and the needed needed uh, professions to keep kids in idaho I mean, that is, that's going to pay wonderful dividends for companies and for keeping kids here. I mean, one of the things that we, and I'm going to talk about your family here in a second, because I know for you, that's the most important thing, but, but, you know, when you raise your kids here, you want them to stay here yep. and, and you need an environment and that they can stay in and that's jobs and housing and a place to be. And I think that it's, it's time well spent for us to try to help uh, from the business community. We're pretty lucky. I, you know, I, I, a lot of times we complain about stuff, but if you look at our jurisdictions to the different mayors we have, oh, yeah. the, the governor we have, the, the legislature gets a lot of flack. There are a lot of really good people in the legislature oh, yeah. too. And you know, to look around us and you know, it could be a lot worse. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in any state. For, hell, for hell's sakes, they're, they're releasing wolves in Colorado. Really? <laughs> Five wolves they released this week. Wow. Um, talk about your family. Yeah. Um, I got the best, you know, none of this is possible without our wives. Right. And no. I mean, it's, they ground us, they humble us, they challenge us, and they, they run everything. They do everything that matters, right? Um, so without her, she's been so supportive since day one. I mean, just go for it and by my side, you know. And at the beginning, it's your, your uh, I mean, it's blood, sweat, and tears, right? It's sun up to sun down. And I, we, she was pregnant. I had a medical cell job, and I'm trying to do real estate. I'm getting, we were living at the hospital for a month because our daughter came early, and I'm getting ready, and I'm doing calls with oral surgeons and dentists and then on the, you know I'm on the phone trying to do real estate just trying to do whatever it was to provide for my family and that was always my greatest fear that I couldn't provide for my family aren't those some of the greatest days oh man don't, don't you look oh yeah I look back when I oh. I look back when I was driving that you know 20 year old Nissan Sentra that like barely could make it down the road I had no money air conditioner didn't work I'm in Tucson Arizona <laughs> moonlighting all over the place and I and I think back as like some of the happiest days too right when you're just oh. grinding the happiest, the purest. We lived in Europe together, and I think the year I was playing in Germany, our apartment was smaller, you know, than your office. And the kitchen had one stovetop, a microwave, and a fridge that could fit a gallon of milk. 
And, you know, we just loved it. it. We were present. It was, you know, we were two kids with, you know, just traveling. And I was just I was getting to play basketball. And it was, you know, the simplest times, the times we look back are the greatest. And now we've been married 10 years and we got two kids who are just dynamite. I mean, they are dynamite. I'm so in love with our two kids. They, when they start doing things, it's just so funny. I mean, so much personality. I love watching you around them, how much they love you. I, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but... Um... I have a great story to tell. So I was uh, I was in Tucson, and I literally we had this old red Nissan Sentra that at some point a squirrel went up into it, and a, my hunting dog tried to get the squirrel, so it was completely scratched up, and it looked like a just a bomber, right? <laughs> and it had no air conditioning, and so you got to remember that part of the story. So I'm in the ER working a, a, a 3 a.m. shift. And that's when you get off, and the radio goes off, and there's this little kid just screaming in the background, hysterically in the ambulance. And they're coming in, and the guy, the, the paramedic's like, hey, I can't talk right now, but we'll be there in five minutes. Boom, and he hangs up the phone. So I'm thinking the kid's been shot, hit by a car. Oh I mean, we're gosh. all freaking out. So the whole team goes, and we wait out by the ambulance bay where the comes in. I was at Keno Community Hospital. And the, the ambulance comes in, they throw the doors open, and he is screaming at the top of his lungs. Well, he had zipped his penis into his <laughs> zipper, okay? <laughs> and, and that's what it was all about. And they're like, this kid's going crazy. He's, he's caught in there. And, and the funny thing about the story is I had just learned, like a week before I had the same thing happen, and I had this old crusty attending come up to me, and he's like, eh, if you ever have this, it's the easiest thing ever. You just cut from the bottom, and it opens right up, and it's done. So I know what right to do, right? And I'm, I walk up in the ambulance, cut the zipper, pull it out, and he's fine, right? So, so it's over. They, they bring him in the hospital, but then that was it. So this was like at 10 o'clock at night, right? So now I get off at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm, I'm done with my shift. And when you left Keno Community Hospital, you always walked fast to your car because it was kind of on the bad side of Tucson, middle of okay. the night, you never know. So I'm kind of heading towards my Nissan Sentra. And uh, anyway, I hear this, hey, doctor, doctor, doctor. And I'm like looking around, and I turn around, and it's this little boy, and he runs full speed, and he jumps into my arms. He's like, you saved my life, man. You saved my life tonight. Oh, man. And I give him this big hug, and I get, my, I get in my car, and I'm going home on the freeway, and it's, it's in the middle of the summer, and I got my windows down, and I, I start crying. Oh, man. And I'm like, does life get any better than this? No. You, know, you always want to do your dream. Oh, you're man. There, you're helping people. You're, you're, it, it, it just was one of those moments for me that it, you go back to those times when it's the, it's the leanest and oh, toughest. Yeah those are the ones that define you, I think. And I think to be able to reflect on that, because we get so busy and it's just accomplished task, task, meeting, meeting, to just take some time to reflect the good memories and the gratitude. I don't do that enough. I don't either. Do you, I'm horrible at it. How, do you, how, 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 how are we going to change ourselves? How, how do you do that? Because I think we need to do more of it. You get older like I am, and now you look back and you go, man, I should have done that more. Yeah, I mean, we're 2024. Yesterday I blinked and it was 2015 and then 2018. And if we don't create... A, you know, a plan to do it. Another five years can go by. We're gonna talk to each other and say, if you know, have you, nope, I haven't either. I think we gotta hold each other accountable. Hey, looking forward to next year. Uh, what are some things you're looking forward to? I'm excited. I'm excited for a lot of things. Uh, we have some really cool projects coming on. You know, my team. Tell us a little bit about. We got a Scott a subdivision we're doing with the Scott family in Eagle. That'll be pretty cool. It's an acreage, high-end luxury community. Um, we have a subdivision we're doing by Eagle High School. Um, we have a couple subdivisions we're doing in CUNA, one in Star. Um, I'm working on another one in Eagle. So there's some there's some fun things happening. And then the resale is my bread and butter. You know, it's like I did for your son. I love that. It's every situation's different. And any way I can make a difference, like I just love it. It's yeah. the competitive juice. I, I was gonna bring it up too. So so I called Matt because my son was moving to Arizona, and I said, Hey, Matt, here's the situation. And what I love about you, it's like one call, and then your team just is like, boom. Yep. We got this thing handled. And, you know, I, I, I'll also remember, I, I remember the first time I was taught the word of what a true pro is. And, and I think in sports we kind of understand what a pro is, but business sometimes we don't talk about what a pro is, right? Yeah. And, and what it means to be a true professional. And I think when I think of your team, because I got to interact with yeah. them, they're pros, yeah. top, to, top to bottom they're pros. They're awesome. The way, they, the way they handle everything, the way it just gets done. Uh, you've built a really good team and absolutely killed it for my son in a time when we didn't know how it would work out. 
so uh, you ought to probably come if people want to get a hold of you. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, BowsherRealEstate.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and you know, call me. I answer my phone. <laughs> he answers his phone. So BowsherRealEstate.com. Thank you so much for coming on. Buddy. Yeah, thank you. Love this you. is Appreciate awesome. All you do for the community and you what too. a good friend you are. Thanks. Appreciate you, Tommy. All right, thanks.